When we talk Formula 1 car manufacturers, the ones that come to mind are Mercedes, McLaren, Ferrari, Alfa Romeo from Europe, Toyota and Honda from Asia, but not many from North America. Not Chevrolet, Dodge, Chrysler, Cadillac or Ford. Even though they have a very rich racing history, Formula 1 involvement hasn't ever been their number one priority. Well, that's actually not completely true. Today, we're going to cover Ford's involvement in Formula 1, the many wins and championships they got as suppliers and the project they started as factory-like teams, with the likes of the old Haas team, Benetton and the Jaguar project. The first ever Ford Formula 1 entry was by the small team Canadian Stebro Racing. Yeah, that is Stebro, no Stepbro, by the way. In 1963 where Peter Broker drove a Ford Power Stabro Mark IV at the US Grand Prix that took place in Watkins Glen. One of entries would be the norm until the buyout of Cosworth by Ford before the 1967 season, where they started supplying the big guys. 1966 marked the start of the 3 liter naturally aspirated engine, and that's the year Lotus boss Colin Chapman convinced some Lotus engineers, who also happened to be the Cosworth founders, to not only join the sport as a supplier, but to supply the Lotus team. The only thing is, they needed money for this. Like, a lot of money. Chapman used his connections inside of Ford to convince them of the buyout and backing needed for a sustainable project. The Cosworth engine was exceptionally rigid, and Chapman used this to the fullest when he designed the Lotus 49 Formula 1 car, incorporating the engine specification fully into the design of the car making a nimble and easy-to-drive work of art. For the 1967 season, the Ford Cosworth TFB-powered Lotus finished second in the championship, with driver Jim Clark third in the standings after taking four wins. That's all the engine needed to prove, really. For the next season, McLaren dropped their BRM engine and opted for Cosworth, same as Matra. Between those three teams, every win but one for Ferrari at France was won by a Ford Cosworth engine. Those teams finished first, second and third, with the drivers' championship looking quite the same. Top three drivers were powered by that same Ford-patched engine. For 1969, all races were won by a Cosworth, with Jackie Stewart and Matra taking the titles. This started an era of unprecedented success for the supplier. Nine constructors and 12 drivers' titles, they won 10 out of the 13 championships until Ford let go of Cosworth at the end of 1980. Still, after this, they won two more titles with that same engine. Once the DFB started to be outpaced by its force induction rivals, the Ford badging was removed completely. What a shock. And attempts were made to reconfigure the cylinder aspect ratio to allow the engine to rev more freely and generate up to 520 brake horsepower. This was the birth of the DFY. Still, this didn't improve things much, and the once great Cosworth engine was now used mostly by the backmarkers. The announcement that turbo cars would be banned came in 1986, and was just what Cosworth needed. The new 3.5 liter naturally aspirated engine next to the 1.5 liter turbos was a tad more competitive. With a rebrand to DFC and an output of 575 horsepower, it was used as a temporary measure to push smaller teams along until the turbo van at the end of 1988. Tyrol, AGS, March, Lola and Colony were all powered by Cosworth in 1987. We are now going to talk about the team everyone makes fun of. Haas. The other Haas. There we go. In 1984, Carl Haas came to an agreement with US conglomerate Beatrice Foods to bring in substantial sponsorship money for a new project, the Haas Lola Formula One team. The car was to be designed in-house and meant to be Ford's factory team in their official comeback. With ex-McLaren boss Teddy Mayer running the team and with both Adrian Newey and Ross Braun under their wing, they managed to convince 1980 champion Alan Jones out of retirement to drive for them. The engine was going to be a Ford turbocharged four-cylinder, but after failing to get their project off the ground for four months, they changed the designs to a V6. During all that time, the season had already started, 
and Haas were pretty much forced to run hard engines for all of 1985. Well, actually, they only took part in four races that season, a DNS and three retirements for the single Haas chassis. For 1986, alongside Jones, Frenchman Patrick Tombay took the wheel of the second car. And when the season started, the Ford engines still weren't ready. Three races in, they finally came. And surprise, surprise, they were extremely slow. The drag coefficient suggested a decent chassis, but that Ford power unit was just nowhere in pace and reliability. Five seconds off the pace. That's even worse than the Australian Grand Prix spec 2019 Williams compared to the rest of the pack. When they finally figured out what was going on, it was too little, too late. After switching to the exotic fuels used during the turbo era, the horsepower readings came up by around 300, from 700 to around 1000 horses. Haas, unfortunately, didn't live to take full advantage of this. After a change in Beatrice's ownership come 1986, the new chairmen were not interested in racing, and pulled out backing by the end of the season, after failing to find another sponsor, Haas withdrew from Formula 1 ahead of 1987. We can see Benetton as a continuation of what Haas Lola could have been. Seeing as when they withdrew from the sport, Ford just jumped ship to another decent chassis and kept on development as if pretty much nothing had happened. After needing some turbo tuning and adjustment after the beginning of the season, Benetton Ford became immediate regular point finishers to get fifth in the standings for 1987. It was the beginning of a promising relationship this one. They would keep close to the leaders, finishing either third or fourth up until 1994. With the introduction of the naturally aspirated EC ZTEC R Ford Cosworth engine, that's a mouthful, Benetton were thrust into championship contention and with Schumacher at the wheel, it all came together. While three of Schumacher's teammates struggled, Michael took win after win after win after win after win after win. Seven wins in the first eight races. He was later disqualified from the British Grand Prix, after having overtaken Damon Hill on the formation lap and then having ignored the black flags. He lost that second place finish after the race, and was later handed a two-race ban. Another disqualification came after Schumacher finished first at the Belgian Grand Prix, but his car was measured as having an illegal amount of wear on its skid block. His two-race ban was served at the following races, in Italy and Portugal. He still took the title of the 1994 season after a suspicious maneuver at the season finale. That was the first championship Ford had anything to do with since 1982. After this though, Renault became heavily invested, and started supplying power for the Benetton team. As a Formula 3, Formula Boxo Lotus and European Formula 3000 team, Stewart was doing quite well, winning 12 titles and over 100 races in a short 5 years. A move to Formula 1 was talked about and then dismissed, but after Sir Jackie Stewart secured a 5-year development deal with Ford to become a factory team, that idea was reversed. The 1997 season was the first one of the Stuart Ford partnership, and it proved really hard for the new team. With Jan Magnussen and Rubens Barrichello behind the wheel, their only decent race came at the very wet Monaco Grand Prix, where Rubens finished second. Other than that, the extreme frailty of the engine meant they DNF'd at 26 out of the 34 entries they would make that year. With 6 points, they finished 9th in the championship, only ahead of Tyrrell. The SFO2 of 1998 was equally frail, and between Barrichello, Magnussen and Verstappen, they racked together 5 points, only ahead of Prost. 1999, though, would prove a completely different situation. The car was quick out of the box, and after qualifying 4th and 13th, it looked to be a promising first race. Until they both overheated on their way to the grid, leading to a DNS for newcomer Herbert and a pit lane start for Rubens. Still, he managed to finish 5th at the flag. While the chassis was good, the Ford engine seemed to be the main issue. By the end of the season, they had amassed a pole position, 3 podiums and a win at the Nürburgring. Ford were ecstatic with this and outright bought the team, rebranded it Jaguar for one of their sub-brands and then went racing for the 2000 season. The Jaguar project was doomed from the start. 
If they taught a course on how to be a successful F1 manufacturer, they would use Mercedes as an example probably, but if the course was on how not to, it would definitely be Jaguar. Bureaucracy and you will do this the Ford way or we will get someone else that will were the two main points, as Jaguar designer Gary Anderson put it. Preseason was all about unreliability and denial, saying that they would be able to win races. Even though Jaguar, Ford and Cosworth were owned by the same company, there was an incredible lack of communication between the parts. One could not criticize the other. That's a surefire way to win championships, right? Their first point came at the Monaco Grand Prix, that is seven races in, and with air detachment problems, an impossible car on used tires, and an aerodynamic team that said everything was fine. They would only score one extra point at the Malaysian Grand Prix, going from 4th to 9th in the championship when compared to 1999, and with not a lot of improvement in sight. 2001 saw a change in management, with a corporate guy giving his position as team boss to Bobby Rejo and a lot of gathering of staff. Results did not improve, but at least they had Niki Lauda as advisor though. They tried and failed and tried and failed to persuade Adrian Newey to join, and disagreements between Ray Hall and Lauda made the former resign before the end of the year, giving Niki team boss status. They would get a miraculous podium come Monaco, the only highlight of a year where they finished 8th in the standings. 2002 was even worse. Scoring only three times, Lauda's team was sinking, and fast. Another miracle podium was what kept them away from BAR Honda, 7th in the standings. Ford execs were wondering why was the team not winning? You can rewind the video for like a minute to figure that one out. Lauda and 70 other staff members were fired with a budget cut for 2003, and with some more flexibility on the team front, they actually improved for once. With a better overall car and under new leadership, Mark Webber scored pretty much all the points that season, leading to another 7th place finish but with much brighter future. Webber and Kleon were the drivers for 2004, a year where publicity stunts to grab the attention of the press seemed to be the main aim, with an inflatable donkey from Shrek being signed by every driver and then auctioned and a publicity spot for the heist movie Ocean's 12 requiring $250,000 worth of diamonds on the nose cones at Monaco, half of which was actually lost during a lap 1 collision. Nice. Ford's ultimatum on the team came as part of a retreat from various motorsports. The Jaguar team was not even sponsoring the main company, and turning a profit seemed pretty much impossible. They sold the team to Red Bull, marking the last time Ford ever attempted to enter Formula 1. Where do you think it all went wrong for Ford? Should they have sold or rebranded the Jaguar team? Let me know what are your thoughts in the comments down below, you know I read pretty much every one of them. That is going to be it for this week's video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like down there, subscribe to the channel if you are new here, and as always, I will see you all in the next one.